Time to discuss the nature, origin, and relevance of earthquakes and the seismic waves they produce. While our knowledge of seismology continues to build, precise prediction of earthquake events remains elusive. This topic is extremely relevant in today's world, as the energy release during such events is enormous and can cause catastrophic damage and loss of life. If you've ever lived in a seismically active area, then you may have personally experienced earthquake events and know that they are for real. This is a view of some of the damage wrought by the Good Friday earthquake that shook Alaska on Friday, March 27, 1964. This magnitude 9.2 earthquake lasted over four minutes and was the most powerful recorded earthquake in North American history. By the way, that's a 1960 Chevy Impala parked in front of the D&D Bar and Cafe on 4th Street in Anchorage. Earthquakes occur all over the planet and at all different depths. This map shows the distribution of earthquakes worldwide over a 10-year period from 1990 to 2000. The map is color-coded to show the depth at which the earthquakes occurred. You can see that the earthquakes are not uniformly distributed and are clustered into certain areas and zones. Their depths are also distinctive in their variation in patterns, with some being more shallow, orange and yellow colored, and others very deep, purple and red colored. Indeed, once enough seismic data had been collected and compiled by the mid-20th century, these simple observations led in part to the original development of plate tectonic theory. When earthquakes occur in or near civilization, we really take notice. And for good reason. The destruction in terms of lives and property can be incomprehensible. Take, for example, the 1995 6.9 magnitude Kobe earthquake in Japan, which left 6,500 people dead and caused over $100 billion in damage. The 1995 Kobe earthquake, otherwise known as the Great Hanshin Earthquake, or Hanshin Awaji Earthquake, had an epicenter that occurred just southwest of Kobe, Japan, near Awaji Island. Displacement occurred along the Nojima Fault to the southwest on Awaji Island, and the Suma and Sueyama Faults to the northeast, both of which trend through the city of Kobe. Much of the city is built on the 2 to 3 kilometer wide strip of alluvial sediment, shoreline deposits, and reclaimed ground. This includes the large artificial islands like Port Island, Rocco Island, and Kobe Airport, to name a few. Construction of artificial islands like these is common in some larger coastal cities, largely due to the limited available areas necessary to accommodate large metropolitan populations and infrastructure. This 6.9 magnitude earthquake occurred at a relatively shallow depth of 17 kilometers. It lasted about 20 seconds, registering as an 11 or extreme on the modified Mercalli intensity scale. The earthquake damaged or destroyed nearly 400,000 buildings. Roads and rail lines were also destroyed, including the iconic pictures of the collapsed portions of the elevated Hanshin Expressway. Over 300 fires occurred, which greatly magnified the damage and chaos. And although no major tsunami occurred, Rocco Island and Port Island experienced significant subsidence due to liquefaction. In Kobe, about 4,600 died in what was the second deadliest earthquake in Japan of the 20th century. This area, and ones like it, are at risk during high magnitude seismic events where large urban centers are built on soft sediment in earthquake prone areas. Numerous similar situations exist in many places around the world, 
including on the west coast of the U.S., in the San Francisco Bay Area, and the Seattle-Tacoma area. Most earthquakes in Japan result from the subduction of the Pacific or Philippine plates, with shallowed a deep foci located in the downgoing plate. However, many earthquakes occur in the overriding plates, the Okhotsk or Amur plates. These shallow inland earthquakes can be very destructive as they typically occur at less than 20 kilometers depth. This earthquake had a strike-slip mechanism, largely due to the accommodation of stresses related to the subduction of the Philippine plate beneath the Amur plate. If you live in the Bay Area of Northern California, look at the trace of the San Andreas Fault through San Francisco, and it's not the only one either. The Hayward Fault is another large, active, dangerous fault system. Look out all you Cal Berkeley season ticket holders. Here's the trace of the San Andreas Fault through the South San Francisco area. In California, the San Andreas is the main fault forming the transform plate boundary between the Pacific and North American plates. It is one of many active faults in the region, including the San Gregorio, Hayward, Calaveras, and others. The last major seismic event on the San Andreas in this area was the 1989 6.9 magnitude Loma Prieta earthquake, or World Series earthquake, which had an epicenter around 90 kilometers to the southeast. The U.S. Geological Survey estimates that this segment of the San Andreas has a 21% chance of having a 6.7 magnitude or greater event before 2030. As with the Kobe area, San Francisco International Airport is built on reclaimed ground. The San Andreas Lake Reservoir and the Crystal Springs Reservoir, farther south, are both situated along the strike valley of the San Andreas Fault. Natural sag ponds once occupied these locations. Across San Francisco Bay, much of the margin of the East Bay area is underlain by soft sediment, with significant areas of artificial ground, including, of course, the location of Oakland International Airport. North of Oakland is the University of California, Berkeley, where the Hayward Fault trends right through campus. The last major earthquake on this fault occurred in 1868, but it has a 32% chance of having a 6.7 magnitude or greater event by 2030. According to UC Berkeley, the university has the infamous, although unintentional, distinction of being the only major university in the world located on a dangerously active, earthquake-producing fault. It's not all gloom and doom, though. Because our planet is seismically active, the study of seismology allows us to learn about the Earth's interior and its tectonic plates. Most major earthquakes occur in certain areas or belts. From this, we have determined the boundaries and geometries of Earth's tectonic plates. We have also mapped the distribution of different types of seismic waves across the Earth's surface, and this has eventually led to the current model of Earth's interior. So, what is an earthquake? Simply stated, it's the sudden release of stored energy in the Earth, which causes vibrations, or seismic waves. A quake's energy is related to the amount of built-up stress. This was postulated in 1911 by Harry Reid, who developed the elastic rebound theory, that as stress builds up in rock, it may eventually start to bend or deform elastically. If the strength of the rock is exceeded, rupture occurs, and energy is released in the form of seismic waves.
The rock then rebounds to an undeformed state, where the process may then repeat. So, where do earthquakes occur? Most earthquakes usually originate in the brittle part of the lithosphere. In subduction zones, oceanic lithosphere can dive to great depths, producing much deeper earthquake foci. Roughly 95% of major earthquakes occur at tectonic plate boundaries, and thus provide useful data in defining the geometries of the various tectonic plates. The focus is the actual point within the Earth where the earthquake originates. Energy from the release of tectonic stress travels outward in all directions as seismic waves. The focus may lie along a pre-existing fault or a newly formed fault. The epicenter is the location on the Earth's surface, directly above the focus. The energy released from the focus of an earthquake takes the form of seismic waves, which travel through the interior of the Earth. These are called body waves, of which there are two major types, P waves and S waves. P waves are primary waves, or compressional waves, that have a direct line of travel. An example would be attaching a spring, or slinky, to a post and then pushing on it. The compressed part of the spring will travel along the spring towards the post. This makes them the faster of the two body wave types, with velocities that typically range between 4 to 7 kilometers per second. And since they travel via a compressional motion, P waves have the ability to move through both solids and liquids. S waves are secondary waves, or shear waves, that have a perpendicular motion to their line of travel. An example would be attaching a rope to a post and then snapping the rope. The larger the snap, the bigger the kink in the rope. Notice that the kinked part of the rope will travel along the rope towards the post. This makes them the slower of the two body wave types, with velocities typically ranging from 2 to 5 kilometers per second. Since they travel via a shear motion, S waves have the ability to move only through solids and not liquids. This aspect of S waves has been used to identify the location of the liquid outer core of the Earth and is also important in identifying magma bodies. Surface waves are seismic waves that reach and travel along the surface of the Earth and are even slower than body waves. Love waves, or L waves, are surface waves that travel with a shear motion. This causes a horizontal side-to-side -side shearing motion. Rayleigh waves, or R waves, are surface waves that travel with a rolling motion. This causes a vertical or rolling ground motion. These seismic waves are the cause of the most significant damage during earthquake events. How do we locate earthquakes? Well, a seismograph is an instrument commonly used to detect and record seismic vibrations generated by earthquakes. Seismographs can also detect other types of vibration causing energy release, like volcanic eruptions, landslides, nuclear explosions, etc. Technically speaking, a seismometer is the internal part of the seismograph that detects the vibrations. Fundamentally, a seismometer may be a mass mounted on a spring or a pendulum that remains stationary during ground movement. It may record both vertical and horizontal motion. That said, the term seismometer is often used synonymously with seismograph. A seismogram is the simple record of the vibrations, whether it's hard copy or digital. Installing the first lunar seismometer was one of the many accomplishments of the Apollo 11 mission. It wasn't all about planting the flag. NASA has deployed seismometers on Mars as well, beginning with the Viking landers of the mid-1970s, and most recently with the InSight mission in 2018. 
Distant earthquakes can be located by triangulation. To get the distance to an earthquake epicenter, we need PNS wave data from a minimum of three different seismograph locations. First, we need to calculate the difference in arrival times between the faster P waves and slower S waves. This time difference is called the lag time. As the PNS waves travel farther from the source of the earthquake, the lag time becomes progressively longer. Here's an example of triangulation. At any given seismic station, the P and S wave arrival times are recorded, the lag time calculated, and then the distance to the earthquake epicenter can be determined. So we now know the distance to the epicenter, but not its direction. On a map, we can draw with a compass a circle with the radius of this distance, thus the earthquake epicenter must be located somewhere along this circle. If we combine this information with similar data from another seismic station, we should get two circles that intersect at two points. The earthquake epicenter must be located at one of these two points. So, data from a third seismic station allows determination of the unique location of the epicenter because the three circles should intersect at one point. This simplified triangulation technique is typically done very quickly and precisely by computer. So, how do we describe earthquake intensity? Well, seismic magnitude is a measure of the relative size of an earthquake. Several different scales have been developed over the years, each using slightly different data to calculate magnitude. And these include local magnitude, commonly referred to as Richter magnitude, surface wave magnitude, seismic moment magnitude, and the modified Mercalli intensity scale. Some of these have drawbacks in that they have limited geographic applicability or do not adequately measure the size of the largest of earthquakes. The seismic moment magnitude has been in use for decades and it is uniformly applicable to all sizes of earthquakes, so it's currently the standard. For earthquakes with magnitudes less than 8, the local magnitude, surface wave magnitude, and seismic moment magnitude scales are all now designed to give similar magnitude readings. The Richter scale is probably the most well-known magnitude scale. It was developed in the 1930s by Charles Richter for Southern California. A Richter magnitude is determined by measuring the amplitude or height of the S wave on a seismogram. It is based on a logarithmic scale with each interval 10 times greater in amplitude than the previous one. The Richter scale itself is a measure of earthquake intensity or essentially its energy and in terms of energy each unit of magnitude corresponds to an increase of about 32 times the amount of energy released. Thus, the energy of a magnitude 7 earthquake is roughly 32 times that of a magnitude 6 earthquake, and over a thousand times greater than a magnitude 5. 32 times 32 equals 1024. The limitations of the Richter scale are that it was developed specifically for Southern California geology, and it becomes meaningless for very large earthquakes. That's because instrument readings become saturated above magnitude 8 or so. While the Richter scale is still widely quoted, it has now been replaced by the more versatile and accurate seismic moment magnitude scale. The seismic moment magnitude provides a better estimate of earthquake energy than other techniques. The seismic moment of an earthquake is proportional to the area of the rupture along the fault plane times the average amount of slip on the fault. It also takes into account the rigidity of the rock. Thus, it measures the physical size of the earthquake event. Unlike other scales, it provides an accurate magnitude estimate for the larger earthquakes. The seismic moment magnitude scale replaced the Richter scale in the 1970s and is now the standard used worldwide. The modified Mercalli intensity scale qualitatively describes earthquake intensity 
by measuring the effects caused by earthquakes. It is a scale of progressively increasing physical and destructive effects from 1, not being felt, to 12, total destruction. Despite a number of limitations, this scale can use historical accounts to estimate the size of past seismic events when there was no scientific measurement available. An example is the 1886 Charleston, South Carolina earthquake, which was a level 10 on the modified Mercalli intensity scale. This has been interpreted to be equivalent to a magnitude 7 on the seismic moment scale. This is the city of Charleston, South Carolina today. It's located at the nexus of several coastal plain rivers along the Atlantic Ocean shoreline. Much of the city area is underlain by barrier island sand, clay and organic rich tidal marsh deposits, and artificial fill composed of sand and clay. How do you think it would fare after an earthquake like the one that occurred here in 1886, which was a 10 on the modified Mercalli intensity scale? The damage caused by an earthquake is mainly controlled by its magnitude, its distance or depth, and its duration. Another important factor is the composition and structure of the local geology. Some types of building sites are better than others. For example, bedrock typically allows seismic waves to pass through more efficiently than soft sediment. Destruction caused by the 1985 Mexico City earthquake was made worse because much of the city is built on soft lake sediment. This is also a problem in many seismically active coastal areas like the San Francisco Bay Area. Human factors like population density and building design, are also important variables. Areas with poorly reinforced building design usually suffer greatly, as has happened in China, Nepal, and Haiti. And here's Mexico City today. With over 9 million people in the city proper, and 22 million people in the metropolitan area. It's North America's most populous city. Much of this area was once occupied by Lake Texcoco, formerly a Pleistocene lake in southern Mexico's central Altiplano, and was where the Aztecs built the city of Tenochtitlan on an artificial island in 1325. The Spanish eventually drained the lake establishing Mexico City, which covers the former lake bed and its soft, heavily saturated clay-rich sediments. The 1985 8.0 magnitude Mexico City earthquake caused significant damage and loss of life in the Mexico City metropolitan area. The main shock lasted three to four minutes and was followed by a 7.5 magnitude aftershock a day later. This earthquake occurred about 350 to 400 kilometers to the southwest and was related to the subduction of the Cocos Plate beneath the North American Plate. While distant from the plate boundary, damage in Mexico City was significant due to the vibrational resonance in the lake bed sediments and the relatively long duration of ground shaking, three to four minutes. By the way, about 60 kilometers off to the southeast is the active 17,802-foot Popocatapetl stratovolcano and its sibling dormant volcano, its Toxiwatl. The degree of ground shaking during an earthquake depends on many variables, including magnitude, distance and depth to focus, the local geology, etc. The 2015 7.8 magnitude Nepal earthquake 
not only shook populated areas in the region, but also affected remote areas in the Himalaya. The famous Hillary Steppe, just below the summit of Mount Everest, was largely destroyed by this event. It had always been seen as a last challenge to overcome before summiting the mountain. In mountainous arid regions, dust clouds can result from earthquake-generated rock slides. Here is an example from the 2010 7.2 magnitude Sierra El Mayor earthquake in Baja. Ground rupture can occur as significant movement on the fault plane disrupts the surface. Resulting fault scarps are centimeters to meters in height, and when this occurs underwater, a great enough displacement on the fault may set up a tsunami effect. This image shows ground rupture in Marin County, California from the 1906 7.9 magnitude San Francisco earthquake. Shown at right here is ground rupture from the 1959 7.3 magnitude Hebgen Lake earthquake in Montana. This is the 1.5 meter fault scarp formed along the Borrego Fault, resulting from the 2010 7.2 magnitude Sierra El Mayor earthquake in Baja. Liquefaction is an effect that can occur in soft sediment, especially when it's water saturated. As seismic vibrations pass through relatively loose sediment, they can be amplified which then may cause fluid movement and separation of the sediment grains, essentially floating the grains and allowing the sediment to flow like a liquid, turning it into goop. This is a real danger in coastal areas, as seen by the effects of the 1964 7.6 magnitude Niigata earthquake in Japan and the 2011 6.2 magnitude Christchurch earthquake in New Zealand. Earthquakes may trigger mass wasting effects like rockfall, landslides, debris flows, etc., typically in areas of steep or water saturated terrain. At left are landslides generated by the 2018 7.5 magnitude Papua New Guinea earthquake, and at right, this is Quake Lake created by a landslide that blocked the Madison River during the 1959 7.3 magnitude Hebgen Lake earthquake in Montana. Earthquake Lake, or Quake Lake, formed in 1959 as a result of the 7.3 magnitude Hebgen Lake earthquake. This intraplate earthquake occurred in southwestern Montana, near Yellowstone National Park and was the strongest and deadliest ever recorded in Montana. Significant shallow focus seismicity occurs in the area, with over 6,000 earthquakes recorded since 1990. The earthquake triggered an 80 million ton, 38 million cubic meter landslide, which originated on Sheep Mountain and subsequently dammed the Madison River. The slide event killed 28 people in the process. Quake Lake had formed in the month following the landslide, prompting the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to construct a 250-foot-wide, 14-foot-deep spillway before the new landslide dam could be breached by the rising water and unleash a catastrophic flood. In heavily populated areas, earthquake caused fire, which can result from broken gas and water lines, is one of the most destructive and underrated of all hazards. Earthquakes produced fires in the 1923 and 1857 earthquakes in the Tokyo, Japan region. In the 1923 Great Kanto earthquake event, 44,000 people had sought refuge near the Sumida River only to be immolated by a fire tornado, or dragon twist. High winds and 
homes constructed largely of wood and paper, were the greatest contributors to this catastrophe. In the 7.9 magnitude 1906 San Francisco earthquake, 90% of the damage was caused by fire. An estimated 3,000 deaths were caused directly or indirectly by this earthquake. And this shows fire following the 9.1 2011 Tohoku earthquake in Japan. Disease, in its many forms, is another major earthquake effect that typically results from the contamination of water supplies. Tsunami can have devastating effects on certain coastal areas and are caused by the sudden displacement of large volumes of water. These are triggered in many ways, including seafloor fault rupture, landslides, volcanic eruptions, and even impact events. Tsunami are not tidal waves, which are caused by the gravitational forces of the moon and sun, and are most commonly seen in narrow coastal passages. Tsunami waves originally travel fast and low in the open ocean, and can cross ocean basins in hours. As the water depth becomes more shallow near the shoreline, the water piles up and the wave grows in height. Wave height can vary significantly depending on the geometry of the shoreline. Whereas most ocean traveling tsunami waves typically average less than a meter in height, large tsunami events produce waves maybe up to 30 meters in height near the shoreline. If you've ever been to the beach, you know that's a big wave. Huge landslides or impact events can produce mega tsunamis, orders of magnitude greater in height than the typical tsunami event. Here are a few more aspects about tsunami interaction with the shoreline. Drawback is the dramatic seaward movement of the shoreline. This occurs when the trough of the tsunami wave reaches the shoreline before its crest. When you're at the beach, the first indication of danger may be tsunami drawback. So if this happens, run to higher ground if possible. Inundation is the maximum inland distance traveled by a tsunami wave. This will vary depending on the topography of the shoreline. Inundation of low-lying areas is obviously greater than areas of more rugged terrain. Run-up is simply the difference in height between sea level and the highest level of inundation. The 1958 7.8 magnitude Latuya Bay earthquake in southeastern Alaska produced a localized landslide-induced mega tsunami, the largest on record. The sudden displacement of water resulted in a wave that washed out trees on the opposite ridge to a maximum elevation of 1,720 feet, or 524 meters. Here's the narrow inlet of Latuya Bay, a fjord in southeastern Alaska. The Fairweather Fault forms the right angle valley at the head of the bay, which is filled by the Latuya Glacier to the north and the North Creon Glacier to the south. The Fairweather Fault, aka the Queen Charlotte Fault, is a large active right lateral transform fault, much like the San Andreas, that forms the boundary between the Pacific and North American plates in Alaska. On July 9, 1958, a strike slip related 7.8 to 8.3 magnitude earthquake occurred about 20 kilometers to the southeast. This triggered a 30 million cubic meter rock slide into Gilbert Inlet and the lower part of the Latuya Glacier. The sudden displacement of water created a so-called mega tsunami that climbed over 500 meters up the opposite ridge, destroying the forested slopes before traveling on and inundating either side of the bay. Amazingly, only five people were killed in this event. While the bay is known for its strong tides, it is no stranger to this type of tsunami event, with several previous occurrences in the last 150 years or so, including a large event in 1936. 
1946 8.6 magnitude Aleutian Islands earthquake produced a tsunami that devastated Hilo, Hawaii less than five hours later, with wave heights up to 55 feet. Note the poor soul at bottom left, awaiting their doom. The 2004 9.1 to 9.3 magnitude Indian Ocean earthquake produced tsunami waves 10 meters in height and a maximum run-up of 51 meters. For whatever reasons, these images were the last taken by John and Jackie Nil on a beach in Khao Lok, Thailand. Incredibly, the badly damaged camera was found a month later by an American Baptist missionary. Frightening and sad. Well, that's all for now. Till next time. <laughs>